Hey, my name's Matt. We're finishing up our series called This Is Us. And if you've missed any of our weeks, you can go onto our website, our YouTube channel, and you can catch up. But we're going to close this series up. The whole idea of This Is Us is we want you to know exactly who South Point is so that you don't sit here for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a couple of years and go, oh, I didn't know the church was about that. And also, when your friends ask you, well, what kind of church do you go to? You want to be able to simply explain the church that you're a part of. And lastly, we all want to be headed in the same direction. And so we're going to kind of dive straight in today into value number five at South Point. This is us. And it goes something like this. We're going to put it up on the screen. And this is really important. We're contributors, not consumers. We give, we serve, and we go to impact eternity and change the world locally, nationally, and globally. And listen, this whole concept that, you know, that we're contributors and not consumers really comes from one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's John 3, 16. And it says, for this is how God loved the world. He, and what's the word? Yeah. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And then we finish 17 because 17 is as important as 16. God sent his son of the world not to judge the world or condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And so here's one thing that we understand. Listen, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe you have no faith or some faith or different faith. And someone said, hey, we have a great band and donut holes. You should come. And we're glad that you're here today. Um, but we, we know as followers of Jesus that when you love, love gives. And love doesn't give out of guilt. Love doesn't give out of greed. Love gives because it actually cares about people and the world around it. As we say, the church doesn't exist for itself, it exists for the world around it. And so this morning, to speak to this subject, our value number five, hey, we're contributors, not consumers. I thought we would bring in somebody of kind of world renown. Now listen, I met with this person last night for dinner and I said, how do you want me to introduce you? And, and they could have been introduced as the CEO of multiple countries, uh, uh, companies. Uh, they could have been introduced as, hey, the, I'm a speaker. I'm a speaker who goes all around the country. Hey, I'm an author of multiple books. And, um, but what they said is, is, I want people to know that I was a part of a church plant from the very beginning that started small but grew to be one of the biggest churches in America. And the reason that they started the company that they did is because they love the church and they want to see the church win because they believe the church is the hope of the world because we steward the greatest news and it's a person and his name is Jesus. So we're going to bring up an amazing speaker. Can we give him a South Point welcome? Let's welcome Joe Sangle. Who's fired up to be at church this morning? That's awesome. I'm so fired up, and I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Joe Sangle. Before we dive into the message, I want to make sure you know a little bit of the fuel that fires me up. Uh, I'm the youngest of six boys. There are no daughters. I have an identical twin. When my parents had identical twin boys for the fifth and sixth children, they stopped having more children in hopes of a daughter. They felt like God would send triplet boys, so they were through with that. Um, I was born 43 years ago. Uh, I'm married. I met my, my, my college sweetheart my first weekend at Purdue University. Go Big Ten. We won yesterday. That is a miracle of God. They do happen. And, uh, and we met there the first weekend. We got married. And we've been married 20 years, June 7th. And God has blessed us with three babies. We were told we couldn't have children. So you know what God does when the doctors say you can't? He shows up and works miracles, and he gave me a baby girl 18 years ago last Sunday. And uh, she's 18 years old. Pray for me. I have an 18-year-old daughter, right? And it's awesome. And then uh, 10 years went by, and God sent us a son, and he's seven. And then three years went by, and we got our overflow blessing. We named her Megan, another baby girl. So we're going to have one starting college and one in 4K. Get fired up. I will be eligible for Social Security when she graduates college. Yes! And so uh, that's a little bit about me. I want you to know my wife's name is Jen, and we are fired up. And we decided you could live life one of two ways, not fired up or fired up. And you could live life victorious or defeated. And I will tell you right now that God's Word tells me that I can live the victorious, fired up life, so I'm going to live that way till I die. Who's with me? Woo! Get fired up. And today we're going to talk about uh, giving and, and about the fact that we are contributors and that we're not just consumers. And man, what an incredible core value that is for a church. Because I believe, see if you believe this, that the church should be one of the most well-resourced, 
well-funded organizations in any community. Do you believe that? If we truly have the hope of the world, and we truly have that which can take the hopeless and make them hopeful, to take the addicted to the restored, the broken to the completely healed, then we ought to be able to proclaim that wherever and however God commands us to. Amen? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And man, I'm so excited about it. Uh, I'm going to take a look at a miracle that Jesus performed uh, that is documented in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. We're going to read about this miracle and see what we can learn from it when we look at contributing today. And it says this, it says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And, and, and so stop right there. Listen, when God asks you to do something, he already has in mind what he's going to do. That is great, great news. So when you do it, that's when he'll move. But if you choose not to do it, he'll hold back until you do it. Make sense? So watch this. He asked this only test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him and said, incredulously, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Can you hear that? He's like, this is ridiculous. And we continue. And another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, said, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Right? We continue, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. Uh, scholars say there's about 10 to 15,000 people there with their families. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated a bite? No, as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. We continue, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. What an incredible miracle. And my question for you today is, do you believe that Jesus, who did that back then, could work a similar miracle in your life? You see, I believe this. Uh, to the core of my soul, that when we put into the hands of the Lord Jesus all of our lives and all of our hopes and all of our dreams, he can accomplish so much more than we could ever ask or imagine. And with that thought in mind, I wanted to pray and then we'll dive in to what we could learn from this message. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for this documentation of this incredible miracle, Jesus, that you perform. And God, I pray right now for every person at the Lesby campus right here in Leonard Town. God, I pray for those watching online. God, those praying for a miracle, God, would you give them the faith but to believe that you can and you will do it again. God, help us to take the steps of faith that you've called us to take. God, more than anything, may we be known at the end of our lives as contributors and not as takers. Jesus, we thank you for gave, giving your life as that ultimate example. We're so grateful, and it's your name, Jesus, that we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. When I look at this great story, I really see three things that happen when we give. We're, we're in that great season of giving, aren't we? We're getting ready to experience thanksgiving, and we're already looking forward to the turkey. Yes! And my mother, she always roasts a duck as well. Yes! And we also get four types of dressing, oyster dressing, come on somebody, giblet or giblet, I don't even know what it is, right? So, and she's got two other recipes and it is incredible. And there's, there's brown gravy and cream gravy and I mean it is awesome. And it, it is a season of giving and we, we go into the season of giving and it, it's really incredible. Uh, you know, we look at it and say, you know, there's 36 days until Christmas is here. That's your public service announcement, 36 days. And uh, are you ready? And are you going to celebrate the birth of our Savior by going into debt? Or are you going to have a cash paid for Christmas, somebody? And that's why we're teaching the financial learning experience this afternoon. I really urge you to be a part of it uh, because we'll show you how to have a debt-free Christmas. 
But as I look in this story, I really see three things that happen when we give. And I think it's important to understand this because a lot of times, particularly in church, when we hear that it's time to give, we might view that only as that money left us, that it is an expense or a line item in our budget. But I want to compel you to think of it differently today. In fact, I want to inspire you and encourage you to live a life as a giver poured out of your talent and of your treasure in a way that honors God. And when you look at it, I want you to think of it as an investment. Do you view giving as an investment? I, I view it as an investment. In fact, I have never regretted a single gift that I've made to our church or the local church. I've never regretted the giving of my time to advance the gospel in our communities ever, not one time. However, I have regretted some financial investments. Has anyone here ever regretted a financial investment you've made? Come on. I remember bro, I rem, I, my first stock investment ever was into Conseco Insurance. I'm from Indiana, and the Indiana field house where the Indiana Pacers played when Reggie Miller was there, right? And the Flying Dutchman, right? Right? It was unbelievable. And... And I remember that they, they had sponsored that, so I bought their stock because their stock had dropped to $2.12. It was a bargain. So I bought some. The next day, it dropped in half. So I bought more. Guess what happened the next day? It went to zero. They declared bankruptcy. And all my money left. It's one of the greatest financial lessons I ever learned. And so I will promise you there's been financial investments I've made that I regret, but I'm telling you, giving to God's word, work and the work in the community, I have never regretted it. And really, there's three things that happen when we give. And the first thing I see from this story is that when we give, we honor God. If you're taking notes today, you'd fill that word in, God. When we give, we honor God. Think about this. When this boy gave up his lunch, did he honor Jesus? Absolutely he did. He did not have to do that, but he gave up his lunch, and in so doing, he honored the Lord. The same thing happens when you and I choose to be contributors instead of consumers, that when we give, we honor God. And it's a, it's a step of faith, really, that says, I'm going to trust you, and I'm grateful that you've provided, and I'm going to put my faith and hope in the provider instead of in the provision. Now, that will tweet all day long and twice on Sunday. So I'll say it twice on Sunday. I will put my faith, hope, and trust in the provider instead of the provision. This boy put his lunch into the hands of Jesus, and incredible things happen. In fact, one of the things that we look at is say, why does God want us to give? Why does he want us to put him first? In fact, I did a word search through the, the word, and I found that the word first fruits, putting God first through tithes, um, the first 10% of what God has blessed us with, that word first fruits is mentioned in the Bible, in the NIV, 32 times. Did you know that? In the King James Version, thou shalt find it there 30 times. <laughs> Church joke. And in the ESV edition, it's there 33 times. And then for fun, I look for the word last fruits. Guess how many times I found that across all editions of the Bible? That's right, exactly zero. You see, God wants to be first. And we find through a story that Jesus was sharing why he wants us to put him first. Because listen, he does not need our money. He already owns it anyhow, right? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 24, 1, it's all his. And here's the news flash. You, you get to manage stuff for a period of time, right? You might get to manage it for 80, 90 years maybe. But eventually, short of Jesus coming back in our lifetime, and please, Lord Jesus, come quickly, amen, right? But if he does not come back, we're going to die. I've done detailed research on this, right? And all of our stuff's going to go to someone else, isn't it? Maybe even someone we don't like that much. So think about this. Why does God ask us to put him first with money? Well, Jesus revealed it in Matthew 6. Watch this. He says um, that do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break it and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break it and steal. And this is Jesus sharing. the. He answers the question why. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, and that's where Jesus reveals why he wants us to give. He knows that our heart transfers with that money. And if we put him first, he has our heart first. When we give, we honor God. Parents, think about this. Perhaps this is one reason we love our children so much. Think about how much money you spend on them, right? Your heart just transfers with that. Grandparents, I'm told from grandparents that it's even worse when you have a grandbaby. Is this true? But I'm told that when you hold that first grandbaby, you, you hold it and you're like, my goodness, how in the world did good looks and intelligence skip a generation straight from you to that baby and your wallet just levitates out of your pocket? Is this true, grandparents? I have some witnesses today. You love them so money will flow to them. Isn't it wonderful when we see this unbelievable thing called giving happen in our own family, when we see our kids become givers, that when we give, we honor God. Now, there's this author who wrote a book in the middle of the 1850s, and uh, I know it might surprise you, but I am not French. So, so when I pronounce this word, don't hold it against me. Um, it, he wrote a book that became a runaway Broadway play that's pronounced something like Les Miserables. Something, it looked like Les Miserables to me, but Les Miserables. And he wrote this incredible statement in there that is such a biblical truth. And he says this, he says, you can live, you can give without loving, but you can never love without giving. Think about that. You can never love without becoming a giver. And he continues and says, the great acts of love are done by those who are habitually performing small acts of kindness. We pardon to the extent that we love. Love is knowing that even when you are alone, you will never be lonely again. And great happiness of life is the conviction that we are loved. Love for ourselves and loved even in spite of ourselves. That is the love that our Father poured out on us, that he so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that we might be loved even when we find ourselves to be unlovable. Isn't that a wonderful promise? When we give, we honor God. The second thing that happens when we give is we bless others. When we give, we bless others. I think we miss this a lot, but the fact is that whenever you give, when you give to God's work here at South Point, never ever forget that that blesses others. When you hear stories of life change, that was in part enabled because you chose to give. When you be, are able to see other people minister to, when food drives are happening, when you see Operation Christmas Child happen, when you give, what happens? It blesses others. Think about this boy. When he gave up his lunch, did it bless others? Absolutely. 5,000 men and their families were fed till they had more than enough. How awesome is that? See, when this boy gave, he blessed others. Now, he did not have to give. He, he could have, and now I remember being a teenage boy once, right? Does anybody else remember being a teenage boy around here? Were you known as generous being the youngest of six boys, I promise you there were less than stellar moments of generosity in my life. You know, if I would have had my lunch and 5,000 men are here and they did not have their lunch, I might have, just maybe, have said, you know what, too bad, so sad, go call your dad. I prepared, you did not. And I might have just sat down, might have, sat down and started eating it in front of them and started to make enhanced noises about, man, is this awesome. Mm, won't you like a bite? Too bad, right? I might have done that. But this boy realized that when he gave, he could honor the Lord Jesus, and he could not wait to see what could happen when he put that gift in the hands of the Lord. You see, when you give, it blesses others. In Acts 4, we see a sign of giving in the early church that blesses others. It says, in Acts 4, 34 and 35, there were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses, watch this, they sold them, they had assets, they had built up net worth, and they brought the money from the sales, 
and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. When they gave, it blessed others and those that were in great need, even the lot, the L-O-T, the least of these. That's incredible. And, you know, when I look at this, I, I, I look through my life and I see examples of generosity that has blessed me. In fact, I want you to think for a minute, every campus, I want you to right now think of a gift you've been given sometime during your lifetime. Um, you know, just think of a gift. Uh, maybe it was Christmas. Maybe it was a birthday gift. Maybe it was on your 16th birthday. Maybe it was last week. I want you to think of a gift right now and kind of get it in the front of your mind. Okay? Think of a gift. Okay, do you have it? If so, kind of nod at me. Do you have it? Okay, that's good. Now, now watch this. When you were given that gift, did it bless you? Some of you, right now as you think about it, are emotional about the gift you received even though it was decades ago. Why? Because when we give, it blesses others. And, and let me tell you, I'll never forget one time this happened in my life. I'll never forget, my parents had had boys in the house for 32 consecutive years. Me and my twin brother were graduating high school and they were so excited because they were getting ready to have an empty house. They were so pumped. They, they really took Proverbs 22, 6 quite literally that says train up a child in the way they should go. And they emphasized the word go. And so they didn't even mask their excitement because the gift they gave to bless us was luggage. <laughs> they did not even hide it. It's like, hey, we love you. It's time for you to leave. And uh, so I, I remember they threw this big party for us and we had our luggage sitting there. And uh, I don't remember any other gift that I received that day except for one other gift. And uh, it was from my friend Jason's mother. Let me tell you about my friend Jason and his family and his mother. Uh, she was from a foreign country. She met a U.S. Uh, serviceman overseas, and they fell in love, and she moved back to the United States, slowly but surely picked up the English language. They quickly had four children. When she found out that she was pregnant with the fourth child, for whatever reason, the father could not handle it, and he ran away and never came back and never made contact again. That fourth child was my friend, Jason. In fact, uh, she, she uh, developed medical conditions to where she could not work, and they lived on full government support. So get the picture, free government housing, free government food, a very challenging life. But she had her kids in church every time the doors were open, and it was just my friend Jason and his family, and, and it was mine, Joe, my twin brother John, Jamie and Jason, we ran around, it was awesome. And, uh, but you can imagine the poverty that they had experienced. And so I'll never forget sitting at graduation with that in mind, she came up and handed my twin and I each a card. And when I opened the card, in it was a single dollar bill. And she hurriedly told me in her broken English that she had ironed the dollar bill so that it would look new. And I remember I was sitting on a stool like this, and I remember the room almost spun out of control because I experienced what it's like to be blessed by the least of these. Where Jesus shares in Mark 12 about how the widow gave everything she had to live on and how it's not how much we give, it's how we give into proportion to how God has blessed us. And I remember jumping up and giving her a hug. She is about this tall. And I gave her this big hug. And I said, thank you so much. And I remember at that moment saying, I'm never going to spend this dollar. In fact, um, I never spent that dollar. And I put it away. And a, a few months ago, I was, I was remembering this story as I was thinking about giving. And I, I embarked upon a search to try to find it. It was 25 years ago that I received it. And I, I remember my wife was so delighted as I went to the attic and started pulling out box after box after box. And uh, we've moved six times. 
and I got, of course, guess what box it was in? The last one at the bottom of it. And I remember pulling out the shoe box and opening up. And I could not have told you what the card looked like. But the instant I saw it, a wave of emotion ran over me. And I remember opening it up and I saw in her broken handwriting her name. And in it was a dollar bill. And I recently had it framed and placed on the doorway to our office with the story of Jesus talking about the widow's might as a, as a symbol that it's not how much we give, it's how we give in proportion to how God has blessed us. And never, ever doubt that when you give, it blesses others. Listen, you may have $4 to give. That's awesome. Give as the Lord leads you because God will bless that gift to bless others. In the hands of a holy God, incredible things can happen. In fact, in our budget, as we started getting out of our financial mess, we put God first and we put him to the test and I found him faithful. Has anybody here found him faithful when you put him first? Amen. And, and let me tell you, I urge you to test him. And under that line, we put a line called intentionally bless others in our budget. And every month we put money in that line item and we pull it out in cash when we're paid and we carry it around with us and whenever we see a need, we just give. It is the greatest, it's one of the greatest lines of our budget. And so I encourage you as a challenge in your budget, you do have a budget, don't you? I'm not getting the warm response I thought I might. So if you don't, you definitely should come to the financial learning experience this afternoon. We have over five free budget templates. We'll show you how to budget in a way that really works. But you will have a budget by tomorrow, right? Just say yes. Help the speaker. That's awesome. And in your line item, I encourage you to put God first and intentionally bless others second. And watch what God does. It turns out when you put a line item in your budget called intentionally bless others, it's almost like God removes scales from your eyes and reveals opportunities for you to give. And it's a wonderful thing to invite your kids and your, your family into. The third thing that I see is the first thing is when we give, we honor God. The second thing that happens is we bless others. And the third thing that happens, and we can see it in the story, is when we give, we ourselves are blessed. In fact, we hear it, it's more blessed to give than to receive, right? And think about this boy. Um, was he blessed as a result of this? Come on, he gave up his fish and chips. Isn't that awesome? And he put it in the hands of a holy God and he walked away with 12 baskets of croutons. Woo! I'm sure it was croutons because bread left out a little while gets a little crunchy. And they walked away with 12 baskets of pieces of barley loaves. How awesome is that? And I love croutons. Isn't that amazing? He gave, and some might say, you're losing all your lunch. How is that going to go very far? That's what the disciples who were close to Jesus thought. And this boy, for whatever reason, he got it at a level that those who were close to him could not see. And as a result, he positioned himself for great blessing. That's what I want for every single person here at South Point, is that for you to be able to know that when you give, you yourself position yourself for blessing. Think about this with this boy. I think that there's actually a greater blessing than the 12 baskets of barley lo loaf pieces. Think about it. That food went away, right? That blessing eventually goes away. I mean, the croutons eventually, like, they go away, right? However, for the rest of his life, he gets to walk through life saying, let me tell you a story about a miracle of what happens when I put my lunch in the hands of the Lord Jesus. See, listen, that great, unbelievable miracle gave him confidence for the future. And I would encourage you today, when you've seen God provide in the past, let that to be the basis and the foundation of your faith for you to be able to take the steps of faith again in the future, knowing that our God cannot fail. Amen? Listen, when we give, we ourselves are blessed. In fact, there's a great story about tithing in Malachi chapter 3, and it's a promise. Watch this. Now, I'm an engineer. I graduated from Purdue with a degree in mechanical engineering. Barely. Barely. I, some people graduate magna cum laude or summa cum laude. I graduated, thank the laude. Um, and I got out of there. 
But I did learn that there are if-then statements, that if this is true, then this becomes true. If this is not true, then this is not necessarily true. This is an if-then statement you can take to the bank. Literally, watch this. It says, bring the whole tithe. Now, the word tithe, for those that aren't familiar with it, if you look it up in dictionary.com, you can look it up right now, says one-tenth of the whole, the first 10% of a whole amount. So in, for us, it's our first 10% of what God blesses us with. Bring it into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And the Lord says four key words. Say them with me. Will you say them with me? Test me in this. And it's just a test. It's the only place in God's word where he says test me and it relates to giving. Watch this. Says the Lord Almighty. So that's the if part. Bring the whole tithe. Bring the first 10%. Bring the first fruits. That's the, that's the if part. If you do that, watch this, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines of your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. And I want to press in on this because I know for a fact that through studies of the evangelical Christian church, that of those surveyed who said that they had committed their lives to Christ, watch this, 2.9% of them said that they actually give their first fruits, the 10% of their income, to advance God's kingdom work. Three out of 100. And let me tell you, I used to be one of the 97. And I was broke as a joke and had no money. I had an average bank balance of $4.13, and I was trying to make it till Thursday. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And I started reading God's Word, the greatest money book ever written. I saw this promise, and I saw great wisdom about how to have a plan for your finances, to have a plan for your life, to trust God, to test God. And my bride and I committed to put God first. And can I just tell you that this promise became real in my life? That this promise became real in ways I never dreamed possible, even in ways that money could not make possible. And I want to compel you in this season of giving, why not put God to the test? Why not through this and to the end of the year, test God? And, and test him in multiple ways. I challenge you to put God first and, and fund God's kingdom work through South Point with the first fruits. I challenge you to do it. And I also challenge you to give to the least of these and see what God does in your life. Perhaps the greatest thing he will do is allow you to carry the stories way more than any financial impact in your life. Amen? I'll finish by sharing how this has happened in our life. And one great example, I have so many examples. You know, I just see that God has poured out his blessings on top of my life. But I told you that I have an 18-year-old daughter as of last Sunday. And uh, I remember when she was born and she screamed. It was awesome. And uh, we, we waited until she was born to find out if it was a boy or a girl. And when I found out it was a girl, I cried even harder because I'm like, how do I raise a daughter? I'm messed up for life, right? And uh, and so this beautiful baby girl, Malia, um, I, I remember when I graduated college, I was dating this, this girl named Sally May. Anybody know her? Or Navient or Federal Direct Loan? Does anybody know them? Do I have a witness today? Okay. Hey, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah, okay. Anyhow, um, I graduated and I, I dated Sally May for a very long extended period of time post-college. And I did not want that for my child. So on that day, that she was born, we started a 529 college savings plan. We started contributing $100 a month. Grandparents, your kid, grandkids, they like the box more than the toy. Maybe spend half the money, the other half go to a college fund, right? And, and so we did that every month, and I made it automatic. And uh, when we got debt-free except for our house, it took us 14 months to do that. I bumped it up to $200 a month. Every month, every month. And as my daughter stood there at 18 years old last Sunday, I get to celebrate that she gets to go to college and I have $97,000 in her college fund. More than, listen, to God be the glory, putting God's word to work, to investing to work, God's blessing upon it, $97,000.
But let me tell you how God works. God gave my daughter an incredible gift academically. He also gave her an incredible gift athletically. And on last Sunday night, she signed her national letter of intent where she's going to run on almost a full ride athletic academic scholarship. And every one of those $97,000, we don't even need for that. That is the overflowing abundant blessing of the Lord. And I am not going to be quiet about it because I'm compelling as many people as possible that will you test the Lord? Will you do it? Will you trust God? And when you do it, let me tell you, you're going to honor him and it's going to bless others and you're going to get to live in the overflowing abundant blessing. And for the rest of your life, you'll be known as a giver. Will you pray with me as we finish this message? God, I thank you for every life represented here at South Point. God, I thank you for the growth that has been experienced since the last time that I was here. God, for the spiritual growth, for the numerical growth, for the campus growth. God, I'm so grateful. God, I pray today that you would help us to unlock the potential that is within us. God, that if we would truly surrender to you and put it in your hands, this thing called wealth and money, that we would truly put you to the test and honor you God, would you enable us to bless others, even those who could not in any way repay us? God, so that we might be a part of your greater story. And God, would you do it? Would you in turn bless us so that we continue to be blessings to others? Jesus, we thank you that you died. You paid a debt that we could never repay. And you gave us that free gift of salvation. We will never for the rest of our lives get over that outrageously generous gift. And it's in your name that we pray this, in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. God bless each of you. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.